Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final student tutorial for Specialist Mathematics with TI Inspire, presented by Texas Instruments Australia. In today's session, we'll be looking at extended response questions as part of exam preparation. My name is Stephen Crouch, and we are joined this afternoon by the TI Specialist Maths team, Bojena and James, as well as a few other trainers um, who are available and willing to answer any and all questions you may have. Simply place your questions in the chat box and, and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. So um, let's look first of all at what an overview of today's tutorial is. So the main thing first of all is that there is a uh, practice questions document that, that you would have um, had the link to when you registered. Uh, that practice questions document has five questions in it plus a poll question, which we'll start off with. So we have a poll question, which is going to be Euler's method with the differential equation. It's a multiple choice question. Um, we then also have five extended response questions, the first three of which we will go through in this tutorial, and the last two will, are, are solved in the practice question document. So question one is about function analysis and graph sketching, which is typically the first extended response question on the exam. The second question is on complex numbers, specifically regarding the complex plane and the argand diagram. The third question is on dynamics, including with, the, with a bit of kinematics in there as well, as well as differential equations. And the last two questions, which, we, um, which are solved in the document, uh, the first one is an input-output mixing question, and the last one is vector functions and parametric equations. Excellent. So let's um, let's make a start then. First of all, we have the yep. Yeah, first of all, we have the poll question, and this is what the question says. Let's consider the differential equation dy dx equals x squared plus square root y, where y at x equals zero is equal to two. We're going to use Euler's method with the step size of 0 0.05, and we have to find the value of y five which is y at x equals 0 0.25. So using Euler's method to approximate that, have a go at this question, and once you get it, have, um, have a go at putting your answer into the chat box. Okay, how do we go with that? Let's see how the question works out. So here's the question again, and there are the five options available and ready, uh, and ready to go. All right, so, um, how do we use Euler's method on, uh, on our handheld? Well, I've got all the relevant information up there, so here's how we do it. You need to press the catalog, which is the book, the book button, and then you can press F, and then press up a few times until you get to Euler. Now, here's the syntax for Euler. We put dy dx, which is our differential equation, which is x squared plus the square root of y. And then comma, the independent variable, which is x, comma, the dependent variable, which is y, then comma, we need to create a set of the initial and final x values. So control and normal round close bracket gives us set brackets. Our initial x is 0. Our final x is 0 0.25. And then we put the initial y value which as you can see up there is two, comma, and then we finally finish off with the step size, which is 0 0.05. You hit enter on your calculator, and then you eventually get 0 0.25x, and the y value is 2.3697, correct to four decimal places. So looking at the options, we are looking at option C, and that is why C is the answer to that question. Excellent. So let's now move on to our very first extended response question. So we have a function f of x defined over a domain of d, and the function is 25x squared over x cubed plus 64. d, of course, is the implied or maximal domain of f. Part a, the first part of part a, is let us go ahead and find d. In other words, let's find the domain. OK, so how do we find the domain of any function? Well, the first thing we need to do before we get to the domain is actually go ahead and define the function. So I'm going to put f 
open bracket X, close bracket, and then control and press the template button, which will give us the assign to command, and then control divide 25X squared over X cubed, and then plus 64. So that is our function, and now it is defined. So to get the domain, we can either type in the word domain, or we can use the catalog. So using the catalog, we can press um, E and then press up a few times until we get to domain. So the syntax for domain is the function. So I'm going to press var, which is f of x comma x. Enter, and we get x does not equal negative 4. So in other words, the, the, val the domain D is all real numbers except negative, except negative 4. Okay, so when, when you're writing this out um, on, your, on your paper, you would write it as x element of, uh, of all real numbers except 4. So the best way to do that is you can press x and then element of all real numbers. I'm pretty sure I can get all the reals there as well. There we are. All the real numbers except, and then make sure you put it into a set bracket. So that right there is the domain. So D would equal all the real numbers excluding negative 4. Okay, the second part of the question. Find the coordinates of the stationary points on the graph of y equals fx, correct to two decimal places. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to first of all find the derivative. So I'm going to define the derivative as df of x, and I will define that as shift minus, so shift minus is a shortcut for the derivative, and press var f of x. So we've got the derivative over there, and now what we could do is, um, if you'd like to display it, you can press var again, of course, press d f of x, and there you go, that is the derivative of f with respect to x. So to find all the stationary points, instead of using uh, solve, we can actually use the zeros command. So menu 3, 4 is zeros, and we, we want the zeros of the derivative function, comma x, and we hit enter, and there we go. So we know that there are stationary points at x equals zero and at x equals four times the cube root of two. Furthermore, we now want to find out what the y values of these are. So, um, so what we can do is we can press var and then f and then simply copy and paste the previous line and there we go. So here's what we know. We know that there is a stationary point at 0, 0, so x equals 0, and then y equals 0. And in terms of the uh, other stationary point, we want to correct two decimal places. So you can go back to the previous, um, to the previous uh, answer and press Control Enter, and you'll get 5.04, correct, correct to two decimal places. And then we have the y values, which is 3.31 as well, correct to um, two decimal places. So the stationary points, or the coordinates of the stationary points of fx are 0, 0, and 5.04, 3.31, correct to two decimal places. Okay, so now comes the next part of part A. Find the coordinates of the points of inflection on the graph of y equals fx. Okay, so the points of inflection occur when the second derivative is equal to zero, as well as the second derivative changing sign on either side of that zero. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to um, define dd f of x, which is the double derivative f of x, as basically the second derivative. So to get the second derivative, we can press the template button and then scroll to where you see a d2 right there. So d2, uh, d2 of f of x with respect to x, and that is the second derivative. So again, we can use the zeros command, menu 3, 4, zeros command of the double derivative of x, comma x, and what do you know? We've got quite complicated set of values of x. We only want two decimal places, so here we go. We have negative 1.05 is the first x value, 
and we have 7.60 as another x value. And looks like there is a complex number in there as well, which we can we cannot worry about that for the moment. We can just look at 7. Point. 7.60, which is one, which is what our point is. All right. So now that we've got that, we can certainly go ahead and work out the y value. So the y value of that of that point is we can go to var f of, and then we simply copy and paste this value in, and you end up with 2.2.87. So 7.60 comma 2.87 is one of our points of inflection. We can actually use the um, the graphing screen to get all our points of inflection and all the other relevant points as well. Okay, so now comes the next part of the question where we have to sketch the graph of fx on the provided axes. So the question has axes uh, provided which look like this. So here is the axes provided in the question. In your exam, axes will also be provided. And we have to sketch the graph um, for a domain of x between neg 10 and 10 inclusive. We have to label all the stationary points and points of inflection correct to, to two decimal places. We also have to label the asymptotes with their equations, as well as axes and steps with their exact coordinates. Okay, so heading back to our calculator, here is a graph screen that's already been um, been scaled, and um, and the window settings are basically pertinent to the question, the question's axes. So as you can see, x goes from neg 11 to 11, and y goes from neg 5 to 5. The same is happening on this axis as well. So you can get that window settings uh, done quite easily. It just makes it a lot easier to get the graph done. Now, in terms of the grid lines, uh, the way you can get the grid lines, in case you're not aware, is you can press Control Menu for right-clicking, and then simply go to Hide Show, and then choose show lined grid. So as long as you've chosen your scale, um, your, your end values and your scale appropriately, the grid that you will get will be very much the same as the grid provided in the exam, which makes the job a lot easier of sketching the, the function. Okay, so I'm gonna press the tab button and now sketch our function f. So var f of x, and here we go. So here is our, is our function. But remember that we only need to sketch it between negative 10 and 10. So we can press the tab button again, press up, and then after f of x, control equal, press left, and then put the vertical um, given sign, and then say negative 10 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 10. So now we've restricted the domain of the function, of course, between negative, negative 10 and positive 10. So what we can do at the moment, well, we can go and find the coordinates of the endpoints. Now on a graph screen, when you do it, it will actually be, uh, appear as, um, as approximations. So menu five and one, we can simply straight away go to 10 and press, um, press enter again on it, and you'll get 2.34. Now, there's nothing in the question regarding the endpoints, so we need to give them as exact values. So how do you get that as exact values? Well, you can go to a calculator, uh, calculator page and simply go var, f, and now we can type in both negative 10 and positive 10 as a set, negative 10, comma 10, and here we go. So here are the respective y values of the two endpoints. So the right endpoint has a y value of 625 on 266, so you can actually double click that and go 625 on 266, and it will actually replace the decimal approximation with the exact value. In a similar fashion, we can go again, menu 5, 1, go to negative 10 and place the point over there. And in a similar way, next 625 on 234, double clicking that, there we go. Awesome, so we've now got the end points over there. So in order to get our stationary points and points of inflection, we can of course go to menu, six for analyze, and then we can go to um, maximum for our stationary point, our, our maximum stationary point right there. So lower bound will be over here, and upper bound will be anywhere to the right. 
Now, notice how there's a lot more decimal places than what we need. We only need two of them. So all you need to do is hover over the respective number and keep pressing the minus sign. So the minus sign on the handheld, and that will reduce the number of decimal places that are displayed. So again, doing that for this one, keep pressing minus until you end up with two decimal places. So there you go. There is our local maximum. And we also have a local minimum, which is also a stationary point. And that is, of course, at the origin. So I'll leave that over there. And we know there's going to be a couple of points of inflection. There's going to be one year between 0 and 5, and another one between 5 and 10. So menu, analyze inflection, so menu 6, 5. I'll place the lower bound around the origin and the upper bound somewhere to the right of it. And what we've got is 2.11. And 1.51 is our point of inflection. We'll get that out of the way. There you go. That is one of our points of inflection. And the other point of inflection, again, menu 6, 5. Put it there, put it there, and there we go. This is what we found on the calculator screen. So 7.60 and 2.87. Right, so this graph is looking uh, looking a bit crowded. Let's see what it would look like when you actually write it on your paper. So there we go. That is the exact same graph that we had on our calculator. Of course, it's been um, it's been drawn over the axes that we had before, and you can see all the relevant points that we found on a calculator have been placed on this graph. So when you draw it, try and draw it nice and smoothly. Make sure that the graph approaches the asymptote, does not touch it, does not curve away from it, and all points are stated to the correct accuracy. Excellent. So now the, second, the next part of the question comes along and talks about a beverage glass that is to be modeled by rotating a region around the x-axis. What is that region? Well, it's the region bounded by the graph of fx, the x-axis, and the line x equals 9. So basically, from the origin to x equals 9, we form a region underneath the function and above the x-axis. And that is what we call our volume of solid of revolution. Okay, so the question now is, well, what does that solid look like? Well, it's always nice to have a fair idea as to how that solid looks. So this is what the solid looks like. But I think it's even more important when you can see the solid being formed. So here is the, here is the actual graph between 0 and 9. And as... I move the slider, you can see the solid of revolution being formed. So that right there forms a beverage glass. Okay, So that is the solid that we are trying to find the volume of. Okay, so our job is to, of course, find the volume of the glass. But there was a, there was a part one, which was write down a definite integral, which when evaluated will give the volume of the glass in cubic centimeters. So, as is always the case, when you rotate a function or region about the x-axis, the volume of revolution is simply pi multiplied by the integral of the square of the function between the two x-values. So, we have fx squared between 0 and 9, and we multiply that by pi. So, if you do, if you do go ahead and square f of x, you'll get 625x to the 4, over x cubed plus 64, all squared, and you integrate that between 0 and 9. So this is just a definite integral. That would be a one-mark question, and the one-mark would be for the answer, of course. Part 2 is where our handheld comes into play, and we get to actually find the volume of the glass. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Pi multiplied by shift plus for integral, then 0, tab to 9, and then tab to the um, integrand. And we've got open bracket var f of x, close bracket twice, square that, and tab over to x. Hit enter, and you get an answer, of course, but we want it correct to two decimal places. So control, enter, and there we go. So the volume of that particular beverage glass is 186.45 cubic centimeters. Okay, now comes the third part of part C. And it says this, the glass is positioned upright, and it's filled with the beverage 
such that it fills exactly three-fifths of the glass. Okay, so determine the depth of the beverage in the glass, correct to three decimal places. So we are after an unknown depth, and what do we know about that depth? Well, when liquid is filled up to that depth D, the volume of the liquid will be three-fifths of the volume of the actual glass. Okay, so this is going to be a solving question, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to say menu 3, 1 to solve, and the way we're going to solve this is as follows. We know that we want three fifths of the previous uh, of the previous um, previous expression, so three fifths of the integral. So shift plus zero nine f of x squared dx. So that right there is three fifths of the of the entire glass's volume, and we want that to equal the integral. Again, shift plus with a pi as well at the front. Okay, so this is the volume of the liquid from zero all the way up to a height of D. And again, we have F of X squared DX, and we are solving for the variable D. Press control, enter, and we get a value of D as a negative number, or you get a positive number as well. Okay, so how can we ignore the negative one? What we could do is we can go back to the question and say control equal press left and put a vertical line and say, well, D must be a positive number. And what that will do is that will reject the negative answer. We end up with D equals 6.143. So when the beverage is filled up to a height of 6.143 centimeters, the volume of that beverage will be exactly three-fifths of the volume of the glass. Excellent, so that is the first question completed. Now let's quickly go through the remaining questions. So question two is a complex number question. And question two regards, in part, a straight line. And the straight line is the modulus of z minus one equals the modulus of z plus one minus square root two i. Okay, so what does the first part of the question ask? It asks for the Cartesian equation of the line in a particular form. Okay, so going to the going to the question here, so we have z minus one. So what we're gonna do is basically press um, our template button and find the modulus command and type in z minus one equals, and repeat the same for the other modulus as well, z plus one, minus the square root of two and i. Okay, so that is the equation of the line, and we're now gonna tell the handheld, okay, well, what is z? z is x plus y times i. And now it's basically converted that, that, uh, that equation in terms of z in, into an equation in terms of x and y. Now that we've got that equation, we can straight away go to menu three, one, go to the solve command, press up to, to highlight the previous answer, comma, y, enter, and there we go. So the Cartesian equation of the line that's given to us is y equals root two over two times two x plus one, which is exactly in the form requested in the question. So make sure every time you see a question and it asks for an answer in a particular form, that you give the answer in that exact form, not necessarily the way the calculator had outputted it. Okay, so that's very important. The second part of the question is find the coordinates of the point of intersection of the same line as before with the circle z minus one modulus is equal to two. Okay, so we have to find the point of intersection of a straight line and a, and a circle. So in a similar fashion, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the, um, the equation of the line and put it into my new screen over there, just so it's, it's ready and, and ready to go. And then what we can do is find the equation of the circle. You can either do that by inspection, that is, it's a circle centered at, at one plus zero i with a radius of two, or you can use the, the, the technique I used prior, which is basically writing the equation of the in, in complex form and subbing in z equals x plus y 
times i. And when you do that, of course, you get the equation of the circle as well. Excellent. So how do we go about this? Well, what we can do is we can square both sides of that and then menu 3, 5 for complete the square. Choose that comma x comma y and it completes the square and gives us the equation of the circle as we would have guessed. Excellent. So let us go ahead and find the coordinates of the intersection points. The way we're going to do that is we're going to do it via a, um, via a simultaneous solve. So menu 3, 7, 1 is the system of equation solving. We got two equations and the variables are x and y. Perfect. So the default settings work very well for us. So what are, what are the equations we're going to solve? Well, the very first equation is the equation of the line. So you highlight that answer, press enter, and it takes you down, and it copies and pastes that into the, uh, into the respective spot. Now, for the equation of the circle, we can't do the same thing. The best we can do is simply copy using Control-C, go to the blank box again, Control-V, paste, and we want it th three decimal places, so Control-Enter, and there we go. So we have x equals negative 0 0.913, along with y equals negative 0 0.584. So that is one of the points of intersection. And then there'll be another intersection point at x equals 0 0.913 and y equals 1.998. So that is what would be written down as the answer to the question. So part C then comes along and says, okay, well, on the argon diagram that's provided, so the argon diagram that's provided in the question is this one right here. So our job is to sketch the graphs of the line and the circle. Okay, so when you sketch it, this is what you're going to get. So you can either sketch it using function notations or you can use the relation command as well. So this is what the sketch of the two relations looks like. And we can, of course, get that on the calculator as well. So again, I've got this same screen um, over here. And what we're going to do is we can go to menu and then three for graph entry. And I'm going to actually choose two for relation. And the reason I'm choosing relation is because we actually have some functions already given to us in the previous, um, in the previous page. So if I press control V, I know that the circle was already in memory. So I can save myself some time and copy that in. And there you go, there is the circle. Then I can press tab and I can go and get the equation of the line as well. So scrolling all the way up, control C, you can use, you can basically control, you can copy and paste um, equations all over the place. The, the handle is very good at that. So there we are, press enter and that is it. That is what the, um, what the uh, graphs of the equations look like. And we have to also label the intersection points. Okay, so to get intersection points, you can go to menu, eight for geometry, one for points and lines, and then four for intersection points. So the beauty about this, uh, about this command over here is you can choose one relation, choose another relation, and as many times as they intersect, the command will give you all of those intersections. So I'm just gonna reduce all the decimal places down to three as stated in the question, and there we go. So we've got the two intersection points with their respective coordinates according to the stated accuracy of three decimal places. Okay, now part D comes along and we have a slight different change of, uh, a, a change of pace really. We're looking at array in the complex plane, which is defined by the argument of z equals alpha. And as, as usual, the uh, domain for alpha is negative pi to pi with pi included and negative pi not included. So the first part of part D says, when alpha is pi on four, the ray intersects the above circle only once. Find the exact coordinates of the point of intersection. Okay, so what does this, uh, what does this look like? Well, what happens when alpha is pi on four. I'm going to go back to this uh, to this graph over here, and I'm going to sketch the graph of y equals x for x greater than zero. So that is arg of z equals pi on four. Okay, so this black line right here 
is argz equals pi and 4. It, uh, it's at an angle of pi and 4 to the positive real axis, and it also emanates from the origin with the origin not included. So as you can see, that, um, that argz equals pi and 4, that ray, and the circle intersects only once. So we can again use our graphing screen because we only want decimal place accuracy. So menu, geometry, points and lines, and we can find the intersection points. So choosing the line and choosing the circle, there we go. So how many, how many decimal places do we want? We, well, we actually wanted the exact coordinates of the intersection point. Okay, so if you want the exact coordinates, uh, we're going to have to solve this simultaneously again. Menu 371, again, two equations for x and y. The circle was x minus 1 squared plus y squared is equal to 4. And the line, well, that was just y equals x. At the end, we could say given x is greater than 0 because we know that any other intersection points are not relevant. And we can get that accurate, um, exactly as x equals root 7 plus 1 on 2, and y equals root 7 plus 1 on 2 as well. And that will be the exact coordinates of the point of intersection. So let's remove that over there, so you can actually put the exact value over there on your paper when you work it out. Excellent. So that's the first part done. Now, um, and this is what, of course, what I've just shown you. It's the ray that, that emanates from the origin, goes and hits the circle once, and then keeps going, it doesn't hit the line, it doesn't hit the circle again, it's just a single point of intersection. Okay, now comes the second part of the question, which says, state the range of values of alpha for which the ray intersects both the circle and the above line. Now, this is more of a visual, visual analysis question, and this one does require a bit, of, a bit of extra thought in terms of what the graph is doing. Okay, so here is what uh, here is what's going on. We have this red line over here, which has a gradient of square root two. Where did it get square root two from? Well, the equation of the of the line was root two times two all over two. So that gradient over there is of course square root of two. So what what happens is that the gradient of this red line is of course square root two. So if you had a ray starting at the origin, which is what argz equals alpha is talking about, if you had a ray starting at the origin, it would look like this, and it would basically keep going, basically keep going anticlockwise from there. So right now, let's just say that this ray has the exact same gradient as the red line over there. The gradient of this would also be square root two. In other words, the angle that this ray makes with the makes with the positive x-axis would be the inverse tan of square root two, and and the, the ray and the line would be parallel. As soon as the angle increases past inverse tan of root two, this line will now hit the circle, of course, but it will also hit the red line over there, and so will it do the same thing all the way until you get until you get to pi. So when the when alpha is greater than inverse tan of root two all the way to pi, you will get um, you will get intersections with both the line and the circle. In a similar fashion, if you go all the way to the anticlockwise direction and you basically take an angle of negative pi minus the inverse tan of root two, it will again be parallel like this, and you take it all the way to negative pi. So the answer, the answer to part um, to part E or to part D, part two, as um, as as a question would be would be um, inverse tan of root two all the way to pi, union with uh, negative pi not included, all the way to negative pi plus inverse tan of root two. So that would be the answer to that question for the range of values of alpha. So for part E now, so for part E, we're looking at a region that exists in the first, first quadrant, and the region is S. Okay, so what is the region S? Well, the region S um, is bounded 
by the circle and the line and the y-axis. So the only way to get the area of S, it's not, a, it's not a nice sector, it's not a segment, it's none of that. Really, the only way to get S is to simply do, uh, simply perform an integration, a definite integration from x equals zero to the intersection point, which was root seven plus one over two, as you recall from a previous part of the question. And you integrate that between zero and root seven plus one over two of the circle, or at least the upper circle, minus the straight line. So you have all this uh, on your CAS in, in the history, so you can use that to get the value of S. Now, in the interest of time, um, what I might do is quickly go through, uh, go through just the, the main ideas behind, uh, behind question three, and, and then hopefully that will give you a good idea as to how these questions, uh, questions work out. Okay, so question three, as I mentioned before, is a dynamics question where there's a 20 kilogram block that is on a smooth plane and there is a light inextensible string that's angled at 10 degrees to the plane and it's pulling with the force of T newtons. So part A asks for drawing and labeling all other forces acting on the block. Well, there's only two other forces, forces acting on that block and that is the weight force or the force due to gravity and we've also got the normal reaction force as well. And all these forces are in equilibrium because, because the block is at rest, it's not moving. Part B, to find the value of T, all you would need to do is simply equate the, um, the, the component of T that's parallel to the plane, which is T cos 10, and you wanna equate that to the component of 20G that's parallel to the plane, which is 20G sine 30 degrees. That is how you would find the value of T. And then in part C, we get, um, yeah, and then in part C, we get to, we get asked to find, uh, to show that the acceleration of the block is given by a particular quantity. So where does this come from? Well, in the question, um, the rope is cut and the block now experiences a, a resistance force of, um, of V squared Newtons. So we have, basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a force like a force diagram that looks like this. There's no string anymore. There's no tension pulling it back. In other words, what we now have is we have a resistance force of V squared that is impeding the motion down the plane and the 20 G and N forces are still the same. So how do we actually go about this? Well, I've, got, I've written out the solutions of here. So 20 G sine 30 degrees is the component of the weight force acting down the plane. And what is acting uh, up the plane is the V squared force. So that's the downwards force minus the backwards force. And that is of course equal to MA, 20 times A. Now 20 G sine 30, sine 30 degrees is of course a half. So 20 G times half is 10 G. And G is 9.8 as it is in specialist maths. So that is 98 right there. And of course, we've now proved that the acceleration is 98 minus V squared all over 20. So just remember that when you have show that questions, you need to show sufficient working um, that shows the marker that you understand what you're doing as well as you're getting your point across. Okay, the next part of the question then talks about, okay, we're now gonna relate the speed of the block to the distance that it has traveled. So what that means is that when the block is at rest on the plane over here, the initial condition is x equals zero and v equals zero. So we're gonna end up with a differential equation and we're gonna solve that. So uh, we have our acceleration from the previous question. We know that one form of acceleration is v dv dx. So we can replace your acceleration with that and the right-hand side remains the same. And then all you have to do is simply divide both sides by v and you end up with the equation that is being asked, asked for. So dv dx is 98 minus v squared, all over 20 v as required. So the question says, find v in terms of x in a particular form. In fact, I might quickly do this one on the calculator. Okay, so how do we get this one done? This is a, a de solve command. So menu, four for calculus, and then differential solver is down at option D. So the equation 
is V dash equals 98 minus V squared all over 20V. Be very careful with brackets. This is very, very important. The independent variable is X our distance. Dependent variable is V our velocity. And our initial condition, well, the velocity at X equals zero was zero. It started at rest. Solve it, and this is what we get. V squared is 98 minus 98 times e to the negative x on 10. In other words, the function v is simply the positive square root of this function right there. And that is part d done. So we now have the velocity in terms of the traveled distance. OK, so um, the final part of the question is this. It says it takes capital T seconds for the block to reach the bottom of the inclined plane. So the, the block, of course, reaches the, reaches the bottom of the inclined plane. The question asks to find uh, a definite integral for the amount of time taken for the block and, of course, evaluate that quantity. So the way to do that is to recognize that we need to connect x and t together, and the v function is perfect for that because we know that the velocity is the derivative of x with respect to time. So you replace v with dx dt. You then simply reciprocal both sides. So you get dt dx equals 1 divided by the velocity. And then we need to use the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that the quantity that you want on the top here, which is little t, uh, in fact, the capital T, which is what we want, is equal to the initial time plus the amount of time taken to get from x equals 0 to x equals 40. Luckily for us, t0, well, that is just t equals 0, so we don't need to have anything at the front. And the definite integral is just from 0 to 40, so that is an integration with respect to x. And the function we're integrating is 1 divided by the velocity in terms of x. And once you work out that integral, you will actually get a number, and that number will be the value of capital T. So 0 to 40 of 1 over the square root of 98 minus 98 e to the negative x on 10 with respect to x. And correct to the nearest integer is 5. So what that means is, is it will take 5 seconds for the block to reach the bottom of the inclined plane. And there we go. That right there is the end of our tutorial today. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. I hope you have found that session helpful, as well as all the other sessions. So on behalf of everyone at Texas Instruments Australia, I would like to say thank you very much for attending all our sessions, and good luck for your exams.